One of the things that I enjoyed the most and missed the most about doing a weekly podcast like On Taking Pictures is having discussions in between episodes with friends and listeners. Sometimes we would go a little deeper on conversations that were started on the show. Other times they would prompt related discussions connected to things going on in our lives. I think the in-between moments are what are most interesting to me, connecting broad conversations around a topic to our actual everyday lived experiences. I'm starting to roll tape on some of these conversations, and while I'm not entirely sure whether it'll become a new show per se, many of you have expressed an interest in hearing more of these types of explorations. With that, I'm Jeffrey Sidoris, I'm talking to John Wilkening, and for now, let's call this In Between. I've got a couple things that I've been thinking about for days. Okay. Maybe even longer. (laughs) For your entire life? Yeah. I'm going through some of my old photographs. Not my old photographs. Old photographs of me. Not not photographs that I've taken. Like old family photographs. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And I I have this, this certain takeaway of parts of my childhood that seems to run counter to what I'm seeing in photographs. What do you mean? Well, like I've, I have this, this for years, I've had this uh, tumultuous relationship with my dad. Right. And I Mm -hmm. had to, I had to sort of cast him in the role of the villain to support my position around our relationship. Does that make sense? Okay, sure. Yeah, to to make it fit in your you the make it to make it fit your mental model. Yes, like there there's a narrative at play in my head about my relationship with my dad, and in order for that narrative to continue to carry water, he had to be cast as the villain. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I'm looking back on family photographs, early family photographs. I'm talking about, and I. And it and it doesn't it doesn't support that model. Okay, yeah. In in a lot of these, well, in all of them, I'm seemingly happy and smiling, and and so I'm thinking about there's this weird thing that happens in photographs where the photographs are like listening to a greatest hits record by your favorite band, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get the you get the highlights, but you don't get the context or the subtext or the little nuance in between them. So I'm, I'm left kind of looking at some of these photographs going, well, maybe that part wasn't as bad as I've, maybe I've been sort of a revisionist historian on parts of my life again, to make this sort of narrative fit. You know what I mean? Yeah. In what way does this current model what problem does this current model of your dad solve or fit? What do you mean? So we create mental models as a solution to problems. Right. We use it to explain behavior. We use it to to justify, may, not so much justify, but to like put an idea that this is this happened because of this, or th- or this didn't happen. Or yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, I didn't get the support for this idea or endeavor because, you know, and then you apply motives to behaviors that make everything fit. Right. It basically, in a sense, you create a narrative. Right, right. That, that in in essence, ties everything together so that you and 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 I mean you as in a human being mm-hmm. um, you that then that makes sense because the we're far more comfortable with a known adversary right than just random or just this unknown thing you know it's it's far easier to just go this is the reason for it than to go Hey, there's no idea why this right. occurred. It just did. 
Well, I, I mean, I definitely think that that I have been at least somewhat of a revisionist historian when it comes to the relationship with my dad. But I was thinking about this in in sort of a larger picture, no pun, um, mm. of of what photography does. There's a there's a great quote that I've mentioned a few times on on a couple different shows that it's a uh, an interview with John Hurt. And he says, and I'm, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's something close to, I'd, I'd rather have memory than photographs because however poor or inaccurate my memory is, I prefer that to being tied to the tedious reality of a photograph. Mm. And I think that there's, there's some truth to that, that we, we, we do make memories where maybe none exist again to support the narrative of of our lives but then when when there is this sort of photographic breadcrumb trail it pokes holes in that narrative or it can poke holes in that narrative because you see little bits of of well wait a minute if if this is true if if i'm happy in this photograph for example then can I infer that I was happy at that point in my life? And if I was happy at that point in my life, then this other part that I've constructed, how does, how do those two things coexist? Mm, yeah. How, how are you wrestling with that question? I don't know that it's much of a wrestle because I think that, that I have by and large sort of put the turmoil. I, I can't keep blaming my dad for where I am at 51. I mean, people do it, but I, I can't do it. I have to now go, you know, and not now, but it's, it's been a progression. You know, did we have a great relationship? Mm, no. From about high school into, oh gosh, you know, thirties or so. No, we, we didn't. But there was that time before it where, you know, it was, it was that, I had a great childhood and, and for a long time he was, you know, that hero figure or, or certainly that larger than life figure. And when that changed, I think I held on to those changes too tightly. And, and again, it's, it's just sort of weird when now there's, there's this photographic trail that supports a different model, you know? And I think that's, that's part of, uh, you know the the power of photography across the board i mean whether it's whether it's documentary photography or whether it's fine art photography i mean i you know one of my favorite photographers as you know is is crudson and it's one of the things that i love about his work is that he's got a narrative in his mind he's got a a backstory he's got this set of characters that mean something to him but he never lets on to us as an audience what those things are so we're left to to fill in those 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 holes or those gaps with our own narrative and i find that as i'm going through some of my early family photographs that i'm that i'm i'm having to do that in a sense myself because i i don't remember so i'm making assumptions around what was going on based upon what's happening in the photograph gotcha yeah in those situations i'm always reminded of the i think it I forget exactly who had the quote, but the quote goes something to the fact of be kind to everyone because you're not, oh, it's not apparent the battle they are fighting. Mm -hmm. I always like, I always find that to be so on point with fam, fa friends and family members more than random strangers. Mm -hmm. Because there's an the assumption that like your dad should. You know, any dad should always be supportive. You may reach the point in his own life where he was dissatisfied with his own life choices or struggling with his own things. And unfortunately, it gets in a sense, in a weird way, taken out on you. Mm -hmm. And you just happen to be the person that it that it got taken out on. Right. But it's but it's very much an interesting question in terms of how important are those narratives in your life in terms of how it brought you to the place that you are mm -hmm. and sort of the, what are the consequences of those narratives being changed with other inputs? Well, and I, yeah. And I think that, 
because they're photographs, not paintings, right? I mean, if I found a bunch of paintings of, of, you know, family portraits that we'd had painted or something, or, or it's different because it's an interpretation. Whereas the photograph, that's a more literal, I mean, it, that, that event really happened. I was really there and I really (laughs) looked just like that. I mean, it's not somebody's interpretation. It's not somebody going, well, you know what? It was really shit, but I'm going to paint them all smiling and happy. That, that's interesting how we consciously look at a, and that photo is such a slice of life. Right. Like probably 60th to 100th of a second. But that's enough information for our brains to go, then I was all the time happy. Right. Or, and and that's, it, that's, what the, that's the rub, right? That's what I'm kind of not struggling because it's not a struggle, but that's what I've been sort of, you know, pondering over is exactly that. For this 60th of a second on this Saturday morning at breakfast at Lake Shasta around a picnic table, I was happy. So I'm going well, but from that, I can extrapolate that I must have been happy all the time at that <laughs> point in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And that that brings up to so many interesting questions in terms of how much of photography is actually true. Because like I said, it is such a slice of life that, yes, it is reality that those events in that moment actually occurred. Right. But it, but but you're but, right. It is it is such an <laughs> it is such a minute part of the day. I mean, you you could take a picture of your wife or of miles. And in that moment, they don't want their picture taken and they give you some scowl or some, you know, and, and yet from that interpretation, like, wow, what a miserable kid that is. Or, you know, like, wow, she was really angry. Well, no, she, she wasn't. It was, it was this tiny fraction of a moment, but then we went on with our day as it had been going on prior to me taking out the camera. Like, Like there is, there is no truth to it in that sense. I, I know it's, I, this is one of the things that fascinates me the most about photography. And it's one of the things I love the most about it is, is just what we're talking about that, that we can look at a fraction of a second and, and pull out days, months, years worth of narrative out of that 60th or 125th of a second. It's funny. Cause you know, I've, I've ha- held, had a camera and taken lots of photos, but in the moment of taking photos, I don't consciously think of that you're, in essence, playing with the illusion of truth. Mm. You know, that we're, in essence, framing rea- uh, reality and going, here's the truth, here's what I saw, here's the moment. And om- in essence, it's almost like advertising, where we're we're pitching or presenting truth, nothing but the truth. Right. We're pitching a moment. Yeah. What, we're pitching what do you, what a do moment. you think of this? How, what, yeah. do, do you buy this? Yeah. Does this, does this, do you react to this? Mm-hmm. You know, in May I went out West and I'm standing in front of some of the most naturally beautiful sites in the world. But because I, I wasn't at the right, perfect moment. In you know, because I, I was often there during the middle of the day, you know, high noon, middle of summer in the out west, things get blown out. Photographically speaking, it's horrible time to make a photograph. Sure. In in essence, I was in the wrong fraction of a second yeah. standing in front of these things. Yeah. My photographs don't translate as well to the scenes that were in front of me. Right. Right. At that moment, the truth that I'm pitching is less than the than the actual truth. Is there any such thing? And I, I I think I know the answer to. Well, I know the answer to it for me. Is there such thing as a perfect moment? I don't think there is. See, I I think our notion of what a perfect moment is incorrect. How so? In that we look at perfect moments as peaks. Like literally this is the highest point Mm -hmm. where, where I would probably view it more like a wave where there's one coming every, you know, interval Mm -hmm. of some time. 
a series of perfect moments. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you've experienced that mo- that moment where like camera or paintbrush where the events that play out are almost too good to be true. You know, where everything comes effortlessly, you know, where it's just one of those things where, you know, maybe you're taking a picture of some guy on the street and you just catch that one moment where the light catches his eye and he gives you a funny smirk. Right. Or you see it like in portrait where for whatever reason, the look that that person gives you is more than that person plus camera. It it just transcends that moment in a way that's hard to understand. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I can give you that, but, but will it ever happen again? I mean, to support your, your perfect moments and waves model, will that happen again? And the odds of that happening again are probably pretty slim. Maybe in that day, Mm -hmm. but But over, over on a long enough timeline, maybe it would. Yeah. I'm thinking of, uh, and this might be a weird transition, but there's a couple of portraits of Mick, Mick Jagger. Mm-hmm. Some of my favorite portraits of all time. You know, there's that moment with him and the Jaguar in the car. Right. I'm not sure who took this one, but uh, there's a bar I go to that has like a whole bunch of rock and roll memorabilia on the wall. And there's a picture of Mick Jagger in like this almost like teal blue chair that I almost get lost in the photo every time I'm, I'm at the bar. And would you, so would you qualify that as a perfect moment between subject camera, light and photographer? I, I think so. I mean, that's one of the frustrating parts of art and photography is that I may think it's a perfect moment, but three other people think it's not, you know, it almost becomes, there's almost a, arbitrariness that's not a word but <laughs> there, to there, perfection yeah you you can't have a world where art is arbitrary where perfect is is not arbitrary and then look at like van gogh's failures until his death i'm not sure if i explained that right but van gogh's, van gogh's paintings didn't change People thought they were worthless, and then the people thought them to be the greatest art right, in the world. Right. Well, I mean, you could say that about a, a ton of the masters, right? That their paintings didn't amount to much while they were alive. It's only after they die that the world sort of comes around to them. Exactly. So, in a weird way, that perfect moment is completely arbitrary. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, the fact that it's arbitrary is not important. No, I see where you're going. And I mean, it's look, this idea of moments is something that I've been thinking a lot about. And, and I've been kind of looking into alternative sort of printing processes. I think as we're sitting here talking about it, I think it's, wow, this is kind of neat. So I, it, it might be an effort to stretch that moment, to spend more time in that moment. The longer I can spend working on the print, the, in a weird way, the, the longer I can spend in, in that moment in which the image was captured. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, get, the, I get the idea. You know, and so I'm looking at... at you know, I think you and I have talked a, a couple times about this. I'm looking at like gum oil prints and gum bichromate prints and carbon printing that embraces the imperfections, but elongates the moments that you get to spend or elongates the time you get to spend in those moments. Yeah. Um, one of the ideas that I've, I heard somewhere on, I think it was on some podcast where an artist can only get to good. An artist can't get to great by themselves. Mm -hmm. It requires luck to get to great. And so what happens is artists have to improve their skill and their craft and their sort of create like all the intangibles in order to increase the odds of hitting good. And then it requires spending longer time, putting more work into it. And just by putting in the numbers, you increase the odds of hitting great. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's one of those where like one every, say for a photographer, one every thousand shutter clicks, luck just happens to shine on you. Right. If you, if you happen to, if you want to say luck strike, but you didn't hit the camera, you didn't see it, that one just misses you. Mm -hmm. And then, but the long, the more you do it, the, the increases those odds and everything. And, you know, to your point, the longer and more involved you could stand in front of the canvas, the better your shots of hitting that are. Well, yeah. I mean, and I think with, with some of the stuff that I've been looking at, it's bringing back some of the, for me, and this is only for me, it's, it's a, an attempt to bring back some of the craft of printing and making an image. And partially it's a, re, it's my own response to cameras being so good, you know, that, that, you can put a camera in auto and get great photographs mm -hmm. on the back of the screen, on your computer, et cetera. But, and, and maybe even hitting the print button, you can get, you know, a terrific print, but I don't feel like in those cases, there's enough of me in that process. And I'm, and I'm trying to get to a, a, a process or a series of processes. It doesn't have to be just one where I feel like there's more of me in getting to the final product. How do you, how do you measure or quantify you in a, in a process? That I don't know. I mean, is it, is it as simple in some cases it, it's as simple as hands in motion. You know, it, it may have taken me a 500th of a second to capture the photograph, but it might take me, you know, four and a half hours to print it. Or it might take a couple of days if you have to wait for things to dry and then apply another layer of this or that. I mean, in in that respect, it's 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 the sweat equity that I'm that I'm chasing. That 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 becomes my thumbprint, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's interesting because then I'm I'm discounting if if that's true and if that if that model exists the way I just sort of laid it out then I'm discounting vision, I'm discounting perception, I'm discounting being present in the moment, I'm discounting, you know, ha having the foresight to at least bring a camera with me. You know, I'm discounting <laughs> all of those things and instead relying on only what happens after capture to personalize it or to, to make it my own, which I find kind of interesting and I'm, sh I'm still not sure how that works. I'm still kind of muddling through that particular process yeah yeah that's what's funny is that we we've all seen a photographer do something and enjoyed it so much that we've tried to emulate it and realized that what they do is not something that we could do mm -hmm. sometimes before I, you even start Oh yeah, so you know, definitely I mean, definitely that too. I mean, look, you and I went to the Sally Mann show and I saw that show probably half a dozen times and was blown away and saw new things about it every time. But I know that I'm not going to go wander around with an 8x10 camera and, you know, a, a cart full of potassium cyanide. I know that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. how how do I get to how do I get to the feel of those images? How do I get to, to the craft and, and, and uh, the sort of physicality of the process of making those images in my own way? Because I'm not her. Yeah. And that's what I think has been kind of fascinating, you know? Yeah. It's, then it becomes one of those where you're like, we're reali realizing that you can't do what they do is almost important as important a piece of inf information as realizing what you want to do. hundred percent, hundred percent. And that, that's the part that I think can take the longest is, is getting to that realization. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, agreed. But then you're, then also having the, how to put this, Having enough introspective to be to be looking at, say, Sally Mann's work and going, I couldn't do this, but there's something about this work that I'm resonating with enough that I go, 
what might be something in there that I can take, borrow, mm-hmm. steal. You mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. how do how do you then take what you're responding to and and bring it to your work? Right. And I think that that's a big step in sort of like your maturation as an artist. Instead of it's almost you know it almost becomes like a a self reflectiveness where you go, I couldn't do that, but something in there is 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 important enough that I want to sit there and consider, and then develop a way to get it into my work. All of the the talk around, and it, this is something that went on for years on on taking pictures, is the, the talk around narrative and and my own feelings of not having enough to say with the work that I produce or not, not feeling like I have enough to say, so I, I kill it before it even begins. And yeah. I think that by immersing myself in, in the materials of the work and, and not focusing so hard on, on what the work is trying to say or what I want the work to say, I get to allow the work to say what it wants to say. Mm-hmm. And that may be just, look, this is a field. This is a, a, a Civil War battlefield in the case of some of Sally Mann's work. And I don't have her life experience. I don't have her familial history. So I'm not going to have that sense of narrative around anything that I produce, even if I shot the same subject matter. But where I can connect is in the materials, is in, is in the process of bringing those images from from the digital world into the real world. That's, that's where I can, to your point earlier, that's where I can find a point of connection or, or a point that I can sort of hook onto and try and make it my own. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think people are born with the work they're supposed to produce or is that something that is developed along the way? Almost a a nature question. Almost a nature nurture question. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Are you, you're, are you born with an agenda, like an agenda of work to, cre- to create and your, your life experience is you, you, you become sort of a, 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 an idea archaeologist. You're, you're uncovering little bits and pieces of it until it makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting question. Personally, I think it's probably close. Like if I had a if I had to pick an answer, I'd probably say it's somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. In that you're you you're born with a personality that is then influenced by the place you lived, you grow up in, the work of art that you see, you know, the people you interact with, and that there's some sort of some sort of weird concoction of that mm-hmm. kicks out certain work. Yeah. Boy, that's a, that's really, that's really an interesting question. Like if you could, if you could somehow, <laughs> you know, if you, it, like when you, when you look at a map very closely and, and you see this part, this is where you are, but then you zoom way out and you, you see the connections to if if we could somehow zoom way out on our lives and see how those things connect and and sort of where they lead maybe you could answer that question more effectively cuz i i don't know i mean i i that that gets into fate and destiny and 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 where does free will fit into that if there is this narrative that you're supposed to tell yeah Maybe it's not supposed to. Maybe supposed to is 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 not the right way to look at it. But maybe there are only certain narratives available to you to tell. I don't know. Wow, that's yeah, a really interesting question. Because like part of me thinks that if I grew up in say Tokyo, mm-hmm. and my exposure to photography is the classic sort of Japanese street photography. Mm-hmm. It mental it makes sense for me to then shoot that way. Right. Everything sort of filters through a, a, a Moriyama grid kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. But but at the same time, like I I also know that with that, I'll probably shoot it 
there, there's some of me as a human being would come out in that. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how or how that would manifest itself, but like, I couldn't see a way, like not, not, not in a pessimistic way, but I, in some ways it would make, that would make such complete sense for me to, to have it unfold that way. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's not unfolding the way that it should where you are now? Huh? I, I don't know. Part of me definitely feels like I have projects that are untold or un, unexplored. Mm -hmm. And one of the struggles I've had over the past year, in a way, I feel like I've, I've pulled back from photography and sort of the internet photography world over the past six to eight months mm -hmm. in a way that I haven't the past couple of years prior to this. Do you know why? Is, is, there a, is there a definite thing or event or, or route that you can point to to say, this is, this is why I'm doing this? Or, do you, or are, has it taken some time to realize consciously that you were doing it? Um, I think it's a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's like a singular moment, but not that my entire goal of photography was to earn a living through photography, but there was an expressed desire to get paid for what I do. And, and what, what I've experienced, what I almost get to the feeling of the, like, I've literally hit my head against that. If you want to say paywall, <laughs> your, the, your own work is behind the paywall. <laughs> yeah. It, like <laughs> I've hit my head so many times on that thing that I've just, it's, in in an essence, it's taking the joy out of it. It's taking the like, I kept on trying to take the work and pushing it into this, trying to monetize it so hard that I think in essence, I burned myself out of my own work. And then it became this weird question of like, if I'm not going to earn money through that, how, where, how do I shift my life in order to provide for the wife and kid and do the things and accomplish the things that we want to without trying to do that with my art. It's not to say that I won't try to do that with my art, but I'll almost view it as cherry on top potential income than trying to make a career out of it. Right. Are you able to still see, and this is kind of a loaded question, are you able to still see your work as good? Or, or have you now, have you now gotten to that point where, and, and many artists do myself included, where because it's not selling, it must not be very good. I mean, I know, and I know, you know, that yeah. those two things aren't connected, Yeah. but have you gotten to that point that, that you've made that connection? So even, even in that, even in my struggle with making money with that, I, objectively know or feel, I guess would probably be a better way to put it. I feel that my work is good, that I've created interesting work and in that it is the quality of my work is far superior to the financial reward that I've gained from my work. And is not indicative of the financial value of your work. Correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Correct. Because in some ways I feel that the Right now, the art market's in this weird place where it hasn't gone through the revolution or it's behind the revolution that's occurring with internet replacing like physical retailers. Mm -hmm. And that you, we're still in a place where the gal, like getting into the right gallery probably matters more than the work you create. But certainly yeah. that's starting to change. I mean, I've, I've seen yeah. a lot of online galleries that are hosting some pretty remarkable work. And it seems to be, I don't want to say the tide has turned, but I, I think that, that it's, there, there, I, there is I, a shift. I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. But like where I'm at is I need, a, I need to put art and sort of creating photos into a box that will allow me to create those work long term mm -hmm. instead of i feel that 
in my desire to monetize things, I've been trying to sprint more than run a marathon. Hmm. And I'm burning myself out. So do you let go of the monetization as a motivator and just refocus on the work? Or mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's the solution? I, I think that that is the, in, a, in, in an essence, that is the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, the artists have struggled to earn a, a living from their art probably since the dawn of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sh I'm sure the cave painter in France didn't get paid for what <laughs> and was know. pissed about it for the rest of his career. <laughs> uh, no more horses for you. That's right. <laughs> and and to in a weird way accept that as accept that as the potential status quo mm -hmm. with the if you want to say the asterisks of life may change. Right. And in essence, as long as they keep on producing work and putting things out there, that that has the option, the potential of changing. Right. But I mean, doesn't that give you, I, I would think letting go of the monetization side of it, at least for the moment, and allowing yourself to refocus on what you loved about it and, and still do, that's got to be pretty liberating. It is. Although terrifying at the same time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, it's, ho it's hard because the, it's, it's equivalent of breaking up with a girlfriend who you thought was going to be your wife. And then, but you still like hanging out with each other enough that you're like, let's be friends. But <laughs> we need to figure out how, <laughs> we need to figure out the, how this relationship works. Odd analogy, you know, but okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah. It's I, like, it's I mean, like I need to get, I need to be cool with you. Obviously, dating someone else, you know, like I don't know. <laughs> Who knows if that analogy works? But like, well, I think there's something to, and I mean, and this, I'm, I'm in a similar spot in terms of, I think, worrying about the monetization and tying that to somehow the value of my work is a what has kept the work from being better than it is and b has kept me from being more prolific than i currently am agree on both parts like for um, myself I, I very quickly get to the what's the point phase very quickly <laughs> yeah you know what i don't need is more of my own shit hanging on the walls like that kind of thing yeah yeah but on the other side of that that's exactly what I need yeah. No. because it's only through more and more work being produced that to your point real early on that you let those, those perfect moments or happy accidents or whatever you want to call them, you give them more opportunity to occur. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I completely agree. You know, Part of me looks at this last year as, in, in essence, like a not a wasted year, but like since since I got back from the trip out west, I've probably gone shooting like once or twice, which is surprising because you you were so affected by that trip. I mean, mm, I, I yeah. haven't known you a long time, but in the time that I've known you, I think you 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 felt that trip more deeply than any other photographic experience that I'm aware of you being a part of. Is that fair? Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent fair. And yet after that, it seems like it robbed you on some weird level. It also robbed you of the desire to put more work out into the world. I, I think, I think what happened was I, I came out of that, that trip having like I had finished the 365 earlier in that year and that trip had been booked and so it became this like obvious next step in my photographic career I go out west I see a see scene like it visually was just a stunning 
it's a stunning place out west. Like it's one of those those places where like if you've never been to like Colorado, Utah, Arizona, like you know, it's one of those places where you're like, oh, I understand why this is this is almost a pilgrimage yeah. for photographers. Yeah. Like, you and it know, becomes you, you understand why it becomes hard to explain. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, like. I understand why, like, you know, Ben Horn, the large format photographer, goes mm-hmm. to Zion every twice a year. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, this makes perfect sense. But it was also a, a very difficult trip, photographically speaking, because the way the trip organized, just from a logistics standpoint, I could not shoot the way I wanted to shoot and get the photos that I wanted out of it. And, and so you, you, what you, what you, in essence happened is that I'm already struggling with the monetization sort of unknown and those questions. And then I have, if you want to say a technical stumble, not, not in the essence that I, the photos were there and I just didn't capture them. It was just, you know, when you're, you're traveling with your family and you have a whole bunch of kids catching sunrise sunset is not a possibility it's just right. you no know, either like it's one of those types of trips so you and, you felt inspired but then you came back it sounds like and you 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 felt kind of deflated by what you were able to capture amidst all of that correct yeah yeah it it was one of those where some of my favorites or favorite photos of the trip were literally my phone pressed against the van window right you know could you do a version of that trip even if it was an abbreviated version could you do a version of that trip solo to hit some of those highlight points and and maybe come back with a different perspective about your own work i probably to sort of reclaim what you in essence have 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 felt like you lost because of it i could and it's something that you know I would I wouldn't be surprised if in the future I I definitely go back there again. Mm-hmm. But in as but in a way I, I I'm also I'm as as I've gone farther sort of wandering into this sort of unknown photographically and sort of career wise I'm also comfortable with what it is and and sort of my reaction to it. I I feel it's a good time not to hang them up or like or do anything like ser- like major like that but I think it was a needed sort of readjustment in terms of what I wanted to accomplish what I wanted to do with it like in you know if I looked at what that trip become you know I'd probably it'd be easy to look at it from like almost like a bitter pill to swallow mhm but at the same time, like, I, I, in essence, I'm almost getting a little zen about it, where right. it's like, I, I am appreciating what it is and what it's become and sort of pushing me further as a human being and as an artist. And that I just haven't figured out where that will, what that will translate it into work going forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But I just want to be clear that that it hasn't taken away the drive to create work. It sounds like there's just sort of a retooling about what that work looks like moving forward. Yeah, and and that I'm one of those people that firmly believe that if you're creative, you need to create in some some capacity. And that it almost become it it almost be something you have to get out of your head. And that I at least at least I know for myself that the only way I'm happy is if I'm creating something. Right. The lesson and the challenge that that trip has has sort of prompted is, is learning where I value and how, what I emphasize and sort of push forward and sort of refocus on the creating rather than on the monetizing and sort of readjust those balances and look to orient my life 
outside of art in a way that will allow me to keep on creating art. Right. Right. Let, let, let them both sort of serve each other instead of pulling from each other. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now how that manifests going forward. No idea. <laughs> yeah. And when you figure that out, uh, would you, would you email me a copy of that manifesto? Because <laughs> it, it'll just be, it'll just be a gif of me shrugging my shoulders going, huh? Right. <laughs> just yeah, no idea. Follow over and over. Me kicking a can farther down the road. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it feels weird because I don't have an answer. I don't have like in a weird way. It just feels like I'm, I'm on, like starting a journey on a very different, like, starting a journey again in a different place mm -hmm. but or you know yeah but the willingness know, to be on that journey is what's most important yes yeah i think yeah you know it's it's that it's that that real kick quote that i love so much it's 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 not worrying about the questions but as much as you're just living your way to the answers yeah exactly as I said at the top, I'm not entirely sure what this is going to be, but I'd love to hear what you thought of it and whether or not you'd like to hear more conversations like it. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Jeffrey Sadoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. -E -E or you can email me at talkback at jeffreysedoris.com. You can catch up with what John is up to on Instagram at John Wilkening. That's J-O-N-W-I-L-K-E-N-I-N-G. Or on his website at johnwilkening.com. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I'll talk to you on the next one.